To begin our program, I want to make sure that we have as much time as possible to not only hear from our Carol Arnold lecturer today, but also to have time for questions afterwards. And so I'm sure folks will be cycling in along the way, and um, I just want to welcome all of you to our convention, but also to this 2017 Carol C. Arnold Distinguished Lecture. This year's lecture will be de delivered by Catherine R. Squires, Professor of Communication at the University of Minnesota. Let's give her a round of applause. I've known Dr. Squires for many years and anyone who's read her work um, finds it very difficult to walk away uninspired. Uh, she has done such a phenomenal um, amount of intellectual labor within our field, but her work is always so eloquently presented. And she, ta she tackles many of the kinds of subjects that individuals sometimes are intimidated to tackle. Um, these, are, these are very hefty social problems in America, and the work that she does um, should be recognized on many levels. This is just one of the ways in which I think we can do so. And I also think that this is, many of the, is one of the ways in which we can celebrate uh, work that is transformative. Dr. Squire's research contributes to conversations about race and society, through interdisciplinary investigations that interrogate media representations of race and other intersecting social identities. Her work employs multiple methods and draws insights from critical race theory, feminist and cultural studies, public sphere theory, and media studies to explore how producers and audiences use historical and cultural resources to create and debate the meaning of social identities in public life. Professor Squire's work contributes practical rubrics for assessing identity discourses in the media, making readily available these discourses to audiences and highlighting how people of color and their allies produce alternative media resources and frames to foster counter discourses of identity and politics. This usually yields in a range of opinions and policy prescriptions that are often ignored and minimized by dominant media. Dr. Squires earned her PhD in Communication Studies from Northwestern University and was previously Associate Professor in the Center for African American and African Studies and Communication Studies at the University of Michigan from 1999 to 2007. Her undergraduate degree in politics is from Occidental College, which is where, her, where she initially found her passion for media research and critical studies in the midst of the LA uprising. That uprising was followed by a not guilty verdict for the policeman who beat Rodney King. She has authored multiple books, including Dispatches from the Color Line in 2007, African Americans in the Media in 2009, The Post-Racial Mystique in 2014, and most recently, an edited volume entitled Dangerous Discourses, Feminism, Gun Violence, and Civic Life, just published last year. She was a finalist for the Tankard Award for that book. Her articles have appeared in journals such as American Quarterly, Critical Studies in Media Communication, The Black Scholar, and also Communication Theory. In addition to her work in critical media and race studies, Dr. Squires is engaged in a long-term partnership with Gordon Parks High School in St. Paul. There, she collaborates with teachers and students to create publicly-oriented media narratives that explore the history and future of the development of the historic Rondo neighborhood. Dr. Squires was recently named a Bush Fellow for 2018-19. And there, with that particular support, uh, she will be exploring intergenerational learning and healing practices. She lives in St. Paul with her spouse, Brian Mosher, and their twins, Will and Elena. And when she's not reading or writing, which I don't know when that is, um, she's on the lookout for interesting birds that hide out in the Midwest. It's ornithologist. Her lecture will focus on how the controversial redesign of the US $20 bill is emblematic of larger transhistorical traumas and socio-political identity politics at work in the United States. The lecture, as you can see on your screen, is entitled Tubman and Jackson on the $20 bill or Ghosts, Gossip, Mediums, and Debts. Please help me welcome our 2017 Carol C. Arnold lecturer Dr. Catherine R. Squires.
Ron's taller than I am, so I'm going to adjust this. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> so before I begin, I want to thank Ron Jackson for inviting me to give this lecture. It's a huge honor to follow in the footsteps of the previous scholars who have given the Arnold Lecture. And as I see friends and colleagues in the audience, I'm reminded that none of us get here alone. And so as I give some thanks to some people who have supported me, I'd like you all to take just a moment to yourself to think of someone who supported you on your journey as a scholar and send them a little piece of thanks while I send my thanks out into the world. There's so many people who have supported me, I could spend my entire time tonight thanking them. Um, but for now, I want to thank my family, especially my mother and my father. My father is no longer on this planet. My sisters, my twins, Will and Helena. I also have to thank three scholars who have been true friends of my mind, as Toni Morrison wrote, even in the hardest times. Dr. Robin Means Coleman, Dr. Daniel Charles Brower, and Brian Mosier, who is also my partner in life and everything else. So let's begin. In 2016, the United States Treasury announced that Harriet Tubman would be featured on the new $20 bill as part of a scheduled redesign for 2020. President Andrew Jackson's portrait would be moved to the reverse side of the bill and placed in a smaller frame. The announcement elicited a flurry of excitement as well as denouncements. These included remarks by then presidential candidate Donald Trump, who said in a televised interview that the decision to displace Jackson was, quote, pure political correctness, end quote. And in one of his first official spectacles of his presidency, Trump went to the Hermitage to lay a wreath on President Jackson's grave. At the Hermitage, the plantation where the seventh president of the United States once held over 100 enslaved Africans. When I began this project, I imagined that it would begin with research on news media coverage, like it often does for me, of the Treasury's decision to engrave Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. I was and remain interested in how having both Jackson and Tubman circulating together through the hands of the public might stir up some difficult historical knowledge, particularly the difficult knowledge of the violent processes of slavery and white settler imperialism. Pairing Harriet Tubman with Jackson, imagine how your fingers would slip over their faces when you pull the bill out of your wallet, touching ex-slave and slave holder at the same time. This intrigued me. Adding Harriet Tubman to the bills that come out of every ATM across the country could unleash some spectral energies and encounters. Columnist Damon Young in Very Smart Brothers imagined one such encounter that might happen when people started handling this new $20 bill, and he imagines and writes a scene of a white man in horror. Quote, a man will enter some type of establishment a bar maybe, a bank perhaps, a bookstore. He'll buy something, a latte, a bagel, a garden hose. And then it will happen. He will be handed a 20. And this will be the first 20 he's held with Harriet Tubman's face on it. He knew this was going to happen, but he just didn't realize it would be so soon, so sudden, so present. And when that 20 touches his hand for the first time, he recoils in horror. A surreal horror because although the $20 bill has her face on it, it's still 20 bucks. And 20 bucks is 20 bucks. So he grudgingly and painfully puts it in his wallet and he walks out day ruined and angrily gulps his latte, but he forgets the latte is hot and burns his throat. And he leaves the store yelping, damn you Harriet Tubman, damn you to hell. So Young's speculative fiction envisions a future where white racist patriarchs are trolled at every ATM. <laughs> this humorous future scenario, though, is not the only possible outcome of a Harriet Tubman $20 bill going into circulation. 
What other reactions or questions or ghost stories might circulate with the redesigned currency? How might we be called to account? When I began asking these questions, journeying through the archives, they led me to ghosts that I never imagined had a relationship to me. As scholars, we pose questions and follow methods suggested by literature that funnel us towards a certain path. But we have to allow for the possibility that we will arrive at a different place. When you arrive at that unexpected destination, you may find yourself with difficult knowledge that prompts a feeling of responsibility, a feeling of kinship to stories previously untold. And today I'm sharing some stories from my unexpected journey. My journey started by asking a basic question. Why do we even have dead presidents on our money anyway? Histories of currency design reveal that this practice began only in the mid 19th century. History in your pocket. That's how the Secretary of the Treasury, Salmon P. Chase, put it when he reviewed the designs for the redesigned currency, uniform national paper currency that was issued for the first time in US history. Treasury clerk, S.M. Clark, wrote to Chase on March 28, 1863, and he imagined the type of interactions and education this new money would have. Quote, the laboring man who should receive every Saturday night a copy of the surrender of General Burgoyne for his weekly wages would soon inquire, who is General Burgoyne and to whom did he surrender? And then he would learn the facts from a fellow laborer or from his employer. And in time, many would be taught leading incidents in our country's history, imbuing them with a national feeling, end quote. So they imagined every time the working man received his pay or bought bread for his family, he would exchange a valuable piece of history, a different lesson on each bill, and experience a national feeling. Jackson's picture wasn't put on the 20 until 1928. He displaced Grover Cleveland. No one knows why. Jackson's portrait on the $20 note looks today as much as it did in 1928. Though contemporary money now has hologram strips to thwart counterfeiters, the actual process of choosing and designing the images remains remarkably similar. And the idea that money is a history lesson in your pocket remains salient, as evidenced by the furor over the selection of Tubman. The foes of putting Harriet Tubman on the 20 argue that the laboring man doesn't need to see diverse faces on his money. It would disrupt our sense of history to include this woman of color. Too bad. Fun fact. <laughs> Harriet Tubman would not be the first woman of color on the $20 bill. That honor was bestowed on Pocahontas in the 1860s. It was Pocahontas who was chosen by the treasury to make her debut on the back side of the $20 note. The engraving was based on a large painting that still hangs in the Capitol Rotunda, the baptism of Pocahontas. In the painting, Pocahontas is surrounded by English colonists, men, women, and soldiers. Her father, Chief Powhatan of the Algonquian Nation, and three men of her people are in the church, but they are in shadow to the side, standing behind the famed Englishman John Rolfe. Two of the Algonquian men sit on the ground. Their red robes and bare chests contrast with the full dress of the Englishmen. So what did the 19th century laboring man learn from this scene engraved on the money he was paid for his labor? Did he gain some kind of national feeling like the Treasury Department wanted? What kind of national feeling did he experience? Did he agree with President Andrew Jackson's assessment from his 1836 farewell address that the Algonquians, like the Cherokee and other tribes forced to walk the Trail of Tears, were merely, quote, the remnants of an ill-fated race, end quote? One day, I was going through my notes about the Trail of Tears, and I got a call from my mother. She asked how things were going with this project, and I started to explain that I had just learned something new about the Trail of Tears. 
While President Jackson is infamous for making the decision to expel the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chickasaw, it was actually his successor, Martin Van Buren, who carried out the expulsion of those tribes. So he validated Jackson's defiance of the US Supreme Court and ordered the soldiers to march so many indigenous people to their deaths. My mother stopped me and she said, did I ever tell you that the deed to my mother's family farm was signed by President Martin Van Buren? It's still hanging on the dining room wall of the Guttermiller Farm dining room. I bet it's still there. I was unsettled to learn that my family had a link to Andrew Jackson's successor, and I felt a chill up my spine. Before I tell that story, or the rest of that story, let's talk about haunting and ghosts. Avery Gordon describes haunting as, quote, an animated state in which a repressed or unresolved social violence is making itself known, sometimes very directly, sometimes more obliquely. End quote. When ghosts appear, home becomes unfamiliar. Your bearings on the world lose direction. The over and done with, or so you thought, comes alive. Ghosts, says Gordon, notify us when what has been suppressed or hidden is very much alive and present, messing or interfering precisely with those always incomplete forms of containment and repression directed toward us. In order to end these cycles of repression and traumatization, ghosts must be treated with respect and not disappeared again in order to end the haunting. Oops, sorry. So under what conditions might the ghosts of slavery and indigenous dispossession speak to us so that we are able to witness rather than deny and repress those memories? As ghosts appear in our peripheral vision, what must be done so we can learn from them what might we have to let go of in order to receive difficult knowledge that ghosts bring in from the periphery? Many of those who argue that Andrew Jackson should remain front and center on the $20 bill do not want to let go of their current understanding of Jackson as a hero of populist democracy. They did not want Harriet Tubman's image to resurrect violent memories of enslavement and imperial expansion. Many of us are drawn to history because history assures us that our people have successfully moved through time. The danger, though, is the tendency to enforce amnesia around traumatic or unbearable parts of our story. Those stories unsettle us and haunt us. And until very recently, dominant historians have erased the traumatic and violent subjugation of indigenous people and people of color from history. When they first began to engage in multicultural inclusion, they incorporated people of color well within the memorial boundaries drawn by the dominant group. So it is not surprising that Senator Jim Webb of Virginia, a Democrat, believed that, quote, the liberal press was wrongly reframing Jackson as a president, quote, known primarily for a brutal genocide campaign against Native Americans. This reframing, Webb insisted, meant that, quote, any white person whose ancestral relations trace to the American South now risks being characterized as having roots based in bigotry and undeserved privilege, end quote. As an aside, I am sympathetic to Webb's concern that the South bears so much of the publicized blame for white supremacy. All too often, the map of culpability for slavery and racism only includes the southern states, reinforcing the notion that other parts of the country were innocent. I'll return to that in a little bit, but for now I will note that my sympathy cannot blind me to the fact that Webb's attempt to rehabilitate Jackson was facilitated by an act of grave robbing. As I will explain, Webb took an indigenous boy's corpse from the grave in order to maintain his sense of historical continuity in the service of Jackson's reputation. To answer the charge of genocide, Webb asserted that Jackson's campaign to remove all Indian tribes east of the Mississippi was justified because such removals were, quote, supported by a string of presidents, end quote. And while he agreed that the Trail of Tears was a disaster, he asks, was its motivation genocidal? 
To answer his own question, Webb insists that, quote, it would be difficult to call Jackson genocidal when years before, after one bloody battle, he brought an orphaned Native American baby from the battlefield to his home in Tennessee and raised him as his son. Jim Webb's inclusion of that orphaned baby, though, does not honor him and the sacrifice of his people in some way. The editorial was crafted to maintain Jackson's legitimacy as a common revered ancestor, not to reckon with the violent history, a history minimized as a mere continuation of the work of a string of presidents. So at this point, I had to ask, who was this Native American baby who was saved by Jackson? His name, or at least the name given to him by Jackson and his family, was Lincoya. Why didn't Webb provide readers with his name? Perhaps Webb was afraid to include Lincoya's name in his defense of Jackson. After all, saying the names of ghosts is a tried and true means of conjuring them up. Lincoya was found dead under, under his dead mother's body. No one knows what name his mother gave him before the US soldiers killed her. Lincoya's mother was killed when US soldiers under Jackson's command massacred a Creek village. The soldiers slaughtered hundreds of men and women, elders and children. Lincoya was sent to the Hermitage to be a companion to General Jackson's nephew, Andrew Jr. Lincoya ran away from the Hermitage three times. There is no picture of Lincoya amongst the many portraits of the Jackson family, adopted, bloodkin, or otherwise. No one ever recorded his likeness. No one knows what he looked like. Lincoya died of tuberculosis before he turned 20. The Jackson family buried Lincoya in an unmarked grave. No one knows where his remains lie on the estate or if they are really on the grounds of the hermitage. Is that how you treat your kin? Is that how you remember someone who was your adopted son? Make them part of your story? Wanda Pillow reminds us that remembrance is a strategic practice, and some strategies of inclusion do not require us to take responsibility as witnesses to traumatic events, but rather just incorporate people into symbols of national unity and identity, and in this case, to give evidence of the multicultural beginnings of the US without starting any real conversation about the complex economies of slavery, colonialism, and race in the US. So too with Webb's insertion of a Native American boy into the narrative of the Trail of Tears. In Webb's story, Jackson becomes an enlightened early practitioner of interracial adoption, somehow immune to charges of racism and genocide. Thus, we must always be wary of inclusion. And I ask, what kind of remembrance could be inspired by putting Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill? How might our sense of place be altered or our understanding of how we got here, traveled here on this map? Could that be unsettled by her presence? Some argue that her inclusion would bring in darkened knowledge out of the shadows of history. And it certainly did for me, but just not in the ways that I expected. I went to find some maps of the United States that were created during the years that Harriet Tubman and Andrew Jackson's lifelines overlapped. In 1835, when Harriet Tubman was nearly killed in Maryland by an overseer who threw a weight that cracked her skull, 25 states were in the Union. Jackson was nearing the end of his presidency and Texas was not yet part of the United States. But during and after his two terms, the United States was engaged in a frenzy of imperial expansion. The map of the North American continent was in flux, due in part to Jackson's influence in government and his wars on indigenous people. As I searched Andrew Jackson's papers in the archive, I found records of the advertisements he placed in Ohio newspapers for the services of slave catchers. One such advertisement placed in a Cincinnati paper sought the capture of a slave named George. 
I wondered if George found safe haven further north, if he have, may have passed through Carthagena, a town I had heard of as a child. Growing up, I had only heard about Carthagena from my dad, who'd sometime mentioned there once was a black settlement there, not far from the Catholic seminary where he used to stay when he would visit my mom in Ohio. But dad's brief snippets about Carthagena sounded like myth. The only real story I knew of African-American presence in Northwest Ohio went like this. My father grew up in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, a town now most famous for being the birthplace of Rush Limbaugh. My father's journey north went through St. Louis, then a stint in the US Army, then to Chicago for college and work. My mother left Mercer County, Ohio on a scholarship to Northwestern University. It was in Chicago that they met. That's me in her lap, just so you know. Thus, the story I knew of interracial contact in Mercer County, Ohio began with my parents' courtship. The story that I learned confirmed the dominant narrative of black presence in the upper Midwest. Black people migrated to urban areas from the South in the 20th century. I had no map or proof of black presence in rural Northwest Ohio that predated my parents' story just the rumor of Carthagena. So when I read about Jackson's slaves escaping into Ohio, it was hard to see them in my mind's eye in the places I visited as a child. So I decided to call my mom. I asked her, did you ever learn anything about Carthagena when you were going to school in Mercer County? No, I just heard there was a black cemetery and part of it had to be moved when they expanded Highway 127. So Mercer County, Ohio is part of what was known as the Northwest Territories. Those territories were the home of indigenous peoples of the Seneca, Ottawa, Shawnee, and Miami nations, amongst others. Many indigenous people left Ohio after the Treaty of Greenville or were forced to leave, but some stayed, including the brothers Wesley and Joel Goings, who were members of the Cusabo Nation. They were amongst the first people to buy large tracts of land from the government in Northwest Ohio. They are also credited by historians now with planning a village called Rumley in 1837, a village where there were many African Americans who had journeyed from the East and Southeast, some as fugitives, some as free people. Soon, in and around Rumley, there were three African-American churches, multiple businesses, and many homes occupied by families of various heritage, people who we would today call multiracial, or were we in New Orleans or the Caribbean, Creole. As Rumley grew, Quakers built the Emlyn Institute a little bit further away for, quote, such colored boys of African and Indian descent whose parents would give them up to the Institute. There, these boys were educated despite Ohio's black laws that prohibited the use of public funds to build schools for black children. In 1840, a free black man named Charles Moore planned a village near the Emlyn Institute. He laid out the streets, he plotted the farms, he placed blocks on a map where shops and churches and taverns would soon sit. He envisioned his people working with and amongst the Quakers, the Pawnee, the Casabo, the Irish and German immigrants who were coming. He called that village Carthagena. It was in this area of Northwest Ohio that John Randolph, a Virginia slaveholder, sound, saw a future for his soon to be freed slaves. He had put a provision in his will to free his slaves upon his death. After his death, his executors distributed funds for the emancipated slaves, today known as the Randolph Free People, to buy land and settle in and around Mercer County near the Emlyn Institute. The executors imagined that these former slaves would be welcomed in this mixed race community and that they would become Carthaginians. It was to this same area that my German ancestors, the Guttemillers, traveled in 1836, leaving Germany for Ohio. 
And so, on the wall of the Guttemiller's homestead still hangs in a frame the deed to that land, a deed signed by the hand of the eighth president of the United States, Martin Van Buren. The road that borders one side of the Guttemiller farm is named Guttemiller Road. But the Emlyn Institute and the homes built and owned by black and indigenous Carthaginians and the settlers of Rumley are no longer on the map. Their names grace no road signs. It's six miles as the crow flies from my great-great-grandfather's farm to the village of Carthagena. The residents of Carthagena and nearby towns all use the same mill to grind their grain, bought dry goods at the same stores, walked the same roads, and rode their horses on the same paths to meet boats that were docking on places on the Miami Erie Canal. At one of those canal stops, a group of white German settlers massed in 1846 to block passage of the Randolph Free People to Carthagena. And here is my inescapable inheritance. Given the map, given the times, and given the size of the community, I can see no way that my German relatives didn't know about or participate in the plans to reject and expel all people of color from Mercer County in 1846, plans that were laid out in resolutions passed at a meeting that summer. Resolved that we will not live among Negroes as we have settled here first, we have fully determined that we will resist the settlement of Negroes and mulattoes in this county to the full extent of our means, the bayonet not accepted. Resolved that the Negroes of this county be and are hereby respectfully requested to leave the county on or before the first day of March, 1847. And in the case of their neglect or refusal to comply with this request, we pledge ourselves to remove them peaceably if we can, forcibly if we must. Resolved that we who are assembled pledge ourselves not to employ or trade with any Negro or mulatto person in any manner, whatever, or permit them to have any grindings done at our mill after the first day of March next. As we have settled here first, that is a lie. That is a lie that banished the indigenous and black and mixed residents of Mercer County from textbooks and official histories. I'd like to imagine that my German ancestors were enlightened members of the community, pushing against the tide of public opinion that called for the expulsion of the black, indigenous, and Creole Carthaginians. But I have no evidence that they raised any objection, public or private. But what is certain is this, 100 years before my mother was born in Mercer County, that community set in motion a future where my father, my sisters, and I would be seen as perpetual outsiders in that part of Ohio. Having my own family history unsettled was an unexpected function of investigating the controversy over the $20 bill. While I will never be able to say and name exactly all of those who were present at the expulsion of the Carthaginians, I can act as witness to the trauma and violence that occurred in that moment. I can imagine the horror in their eyes, and I can find kinship in some way not only to my genetic ancestors, but to also to all those people who could and should have been their neighbors. So I can respond to that feeling that ghosts elicit in us, as Gordon says. They elicit a feeling that something must be done. So my something so far has been twofold. First, inspired by the creative frictions elicited by this history I've been doing of the $20 bill, I have turned to some speculative historical fiction to bear witness to my kin in some way. 
I've written two short stories that imagine what happened in the summer of 1846. In the interest of time, I will not read those stories today. This is actually like a 200-page project by now, so not enough time. But the other part of my reaction, the something to be done, is that I decided I would not go back to my usual practice of media criticism for this project and for this talk, and that I would tell you about my journey today. I've tried to describe the process of my own reckoning through this speech, how I resolved to listen to ghosts and to understand my own presence in Mercer County, Ohio, as a ghostly one. By the time my mother was born, gone from the map were the roads and houses painstakingly planned by Charles Moore. Gone was the Emlyn Institute, taken over by a German Catholic seminary. My mother did not attend school with the descendants of the Randolph Free People or the Goings Brother or the other Creole people who had once lived there. She grew up not in a Creole Northwest Ohio that could have been, but a white Northwest Ohio, alongside the descendants of people who decided to wipe people of color off of their chosen map. Rinaldo Walcott asks us to explore the history of the Americas as a means to, quote, make sense of victimization in relation to the turbulence, complicity, pleasure, and pain of the new invented selves that are only possible in the Americas. He argues that this can be fostered by developing a creolized pedagogy that can contextualize and discuss the tensions and ambivalences of what Edouard Glissant calls a poetics of relation. Glissant wrote that our remembrances of colonialism, slavery, and genocidal war against indigenous peoples have not yet begun to, quote, calculate their consequences. The passive adaptations, irrevocable rejections, naive beliefs, parallel lives, and many forms of confrontation and consent. The stubborn outbursts of invention, born of impacts and breaking, which compose the fluid, turbulent, stubborn, and possibly organized matter of our common destiny." End quote. To calculate such consequences, Walcott suggests creolization. Walcott says, as a way of knowing, quote, creolization requires that we think about how the various fragments of European, African, Aboriginal, and Asians constitute a new perspective on life in the Americas. End quote. As we collect the scraps and fragments of the past that we can find, we engage in a process of reparation from a creolized perspective. This perspective looks squarely at the violence of colonization, imperialism, and racism, and understands them as violent breaks, breaks that are a part of this turbulent production or invention of new selves, breaks that remapped the continent. One such break occurred in that moment in 1846, a moment where a white immigrant majority rejected people of color and thus denied the development of a Creole orientation to life, identity, and community building in Northwest Ohio. This is why I never met a child who looked like me in Mercer County. I never saw a child who resembled Lincoya Jackson playing in the fields or chasing kittens in my Uncle Lou Guttemiller's barnyard on the farm founded by my great-great-grandfather in the 19th century. And this made me a ghost of Carthagena before I was even born. I haunted a place that should have felt like home. When confronted with difficult knowledge, we need to ask, what future did our ancestors lose by adhering to racist and xenophobic practices to make a map of their world? And how can we today address this difficult knowledge creatively to fill in the blanks and generate new relations to our stories and thus to each other? When we use our creativity to imagine what was not recorded or cared for, not plotted on any map, when we write back to officially sanctioned histories, we are calling on each other to, quote, renegotiate complex layers of identification and commonality, end quote. The ghosts conjured by my research into the $20 bill called on me to renegotiate and resituate my Ohio German family's history, to confront how they benefited from colonial aggression 
and were amidst and then acquiesced in some way to the erasure of Creole people. So I accept Walcott's invitation to, quote, consider what it might mean to resign rage, shame, and defeat into mobilizing moments for the production of a new humanity. In this sense, history becomes a process of learning fraught with the risks of arriving at an elsewhere that cannot be known in advance, end quote. This means we cannot repress memories of violence. It means we must take a leap of faith and answer a call, as Sylvia Winter puts it, to create new forms of human life in the Americas. To do this, we have to acknowledge the pain and the violence, the pleasures and the stubborn bursts of creativity. And we have to acknowledge that history has intervened in the invention of who we are today. Lincoya Jackson's ghost called to me when I learned his name. I was unsettled by his story, and I was enraged by Senator Webb's appropriation of his unnamed body stolen from an unmarked grave. Lincoya's life at the Hermitage felt like a ghostly echo of my own sense of being a present absence in Ohio. He made me reconsider my childhood visits to Mercer County with this question. What did I unsettle in those folks who stared at me in church? When I was a child and visited Mercer County, I hated Sundays. Not just because of church necessarily, but because of all the staring when we walked up the aisle for communion. I felt vulnerable to the stares of white people who were not related to us or who were distantly related to us but didn't want to admit it. Some folks would do a double take, others would pretend to not be looking, and in some cases, people stared as long as they could, daring us to challenge their gaze. These were some of those descendants of those German settlers who declared in 1846 that they were determined to not live amongst Negroes and mulattoes. Yet there I was, running around the Guttermiller farm chasing kittens and taking communion on Sundays at St. John's. So now when I remember my childhood visits to Mercer County, I am haunted by and feel kinship with the Carthaginians whose homes and identities were erased. And I think of Lincoya Jackson. I imagine Lincoya plotting his third and final runaway attempt. I imagine he was tired of gentlemen and lady visitors to the hermitage whispering about him behind their gloved hands. I imagine he was tired of feeling like an alien in the land of his own people, tired of not knowing his own language, tired of being an oddity in what was supposed to be his home. I imagined he felt like I did on Sundays, but for him, those feelings were every day. Toni Morrison puts it best, racism exists to distract you. And I was very distracted as a child, feeling shunned and unwelcome in Mercer County. I know not all the people who stared at us were racist, but some of them were. Either way, the way I unsettled them back then was distracting to me. But now I know, every time I crossed that county line, I became a ghost who haunted the people who believed that Mercer County was meant to be, and always was, an all-white space. But I am kin in some way to those buried in the African American cemetery, just as I am kin to those who are buried in the German Catholic grounds of St. John the Baptist. It's serendipitous and strange that being haunted by the ghost of Lincoya led me down paths to glimpse a link between my German-American family and Andrew Jackson's vice president and successor, Martin Van Buren. To let go of the stories I knew in order to learn and embrace those stories that had been hidden for over a century. Senator Jim Webb did not listen to ghosts when he was faced with the haunting, difficult knowledge of Andrew Jackson's crimes. Webb worried that publicly debating the merits of Jackson's military and political career would bring shame on the heads of white people. But that not need be the only result of reckoning with difficult history. Instead of defending strict boundaries of history and belonging, we can prepare ourselves to listen to ghosts, to be unsettled and get lost so we can find other ways of being and so I'll end by inviting you to visit with me and all the other ghosts of Carthagena. We will greet you and all of your spirit kin. 
We will lay wreaths on everyone's graves. We will light every candle and place incense on every altar, and we will stand and resolve in the gap between the known and the unknown. There we will stand between hope and despair. There we will resolve to bear witness to that which was neither our word nor our deed, but is our inheritance and our legacy. Don't worry if you get lost trying to get to Carthagena. Just follow the ghosts. Thank you. Forgot there's questions. <laughs> yes, so please, any questions? Thank you. Speaking of poetics, um, would you just talk us through the moment you decided to write speculative fiction in this project? It's amazing. <laughs> it's, I can't wait to read it, <laughs> but I'd love to hear a little bit about that process. Yeah, I can't wait process. to finish it either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been reading a lot of speculative fiction, and I was using a lot of um, uh, black futurist and black feminist theory on a project on Harriet Tubman for a speech that I gave um, at University of St. Thomas, their undergrad communication studies um, conference in the spring. Uh, and when I was doing that, I created a braid of Harriet Tubman, Sandra Bland, and um, uh, Rosa Parks, and Bree Newsom. And I'm getting worked up because like, <laughs> I can't say Sandra Bland's name. <laughs> so I needed to use fiction to try and figure out what happened in that cell. Because there were so many gaps, because they erased things, and people weren't answering her calls for help. And so we'll never really know. But I took moments that all four of them spent in jail and braided them together. So that's how it all started. <laughs> Sorry. Mercer County is one of the reddest counties in the red state of Ohio. I'm wondering what it's like when you go back there now, if you do. Um, part of what I had to cut out of the talk for time was actually when I went to visit my grandparents' graves and people were wondering why I was in the graveyard. And I said, I'm one of Helen's girls. And they said, oh, I remember your dad. So like they knew exactly who I was once I used my mom's name because she's the only person that I still know of who married outside her race. <laughs> in that, so you know, yeah. So you go back, and there's Trump and Boehner. Well, not Boehner anymore, but um, Trump signs everywhere. Yeah, it's interesting. I also wanted to thank you for a very lovely, evocative uh, piece, and to follow up on the question about the link between your research and speculative fiction. I wonder if the works of Octavia Butler were in any way informing, and if you could talk about that connection. 
Butler. Whew. I mean, Octavia Butler, Nalo Hopkinson, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, they all use speculation for those silences. And also to think about a future that's different, that's not patterned on the trauma, right? And so, um, you know, those, those writers are really important for me for this project. Um, as are some of the people who are, you know, writing about black futurism and things like that. That's all really important to me and, and the queer archive, all of those things are, are really circulating in my head as I'm doing this work. I just wonder if you could speak for a second to the difference in your mind between, um, I, I can't remember the quote, but it was, you know, history in our pockets, but especially with the controversies about Confederate memorials and the difference between history and public memory and what that is and what's happening with that and how that plays into the work that you're doing. Yeah, I guess I'm not really trying to trouble those distinctions. Um, I'm trying to think of other ways to engage in the storytelling that get out of the binary of either we memorialize or we don't, right? And, you know, as I was writing this, you know, the mayor of New Orleans was taking all the statues down. As I was writing this, Charlottesville happens. As I was writing this, so all those things are really in my mind. Um, but for me, keeping Jackson on the 20 with Harriet Tubman creates this friction, right? It's an unavoidable tension that we usually try to avoid. And so that was really the fulcrum for my thinking was, what do you have to do to acknowledge them, hold them both in your head at the same time? And then what does that push you to do? And so as I started out as a media critic, trying to look at what other people seem to be pushed to do, um, then I was like, I don't know much about Andrew Jackson other than he like killed all these people, so I should figure him out. Um, and then I started just going down this trail. Um, but in terms of, you know, we're, we're really at a moment where, you know, the, the rubber is meeting the road in a really awful way. And, we have to figure out how to remember this together. And it's not gonna be fun. <laughs> it's not gonna be fun at all. And that's why I like that quote from um, Levinas that you have to contend with that which was not your word or deed. Like you didn't do it. Like when people say, my, my family didn't own slaves. It's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not your word or your deed, but it's your legacy. How do you call yourself to account. So um, we need to do that. And some people are refusing to do that. They're really holding on to a sense of identity that they think will continue to produce their well-being. And I don't think it produces anyone's well-being to hold on to that. Thank you so, so much. That was just so wonderful. Um, I look forward actually to seeing your talk in print so I can kind of like meditate on it again. Um, but I, I kind of want to ask you, now that we're in this situation here at Dallas, uh, we've, we've had so many talks about what, what's at the core of communication, what is central, what are our roles as scholars, as researchers, as teachers, um, at this moment when it seems like even what we do is at risk. And even, even literally with the latest tax plan that just got voted in on the House side, right, with, with taxing tuition waivers, we might see graduate school crumble before us. Hopefully not. Hopefully we can have it defeated. But I've just kind of heard this, like, tension throughout the conference so far about are we scholars or are we activists? Are we inside? Do we, do, do we work on the curriculum or do we 
look to the outside world and try to do work there. And I, I keep coming back to, well, the two seem so entangled, I, I can't approach it. And I'm just, I feel like I'm right back at that moment again, and at that question. And I, I feel like you've been dealing with this entanglement. Um, and I, I wonder what you think. I wonder what you think. Here, here we are at a moment where we might, again, you know, so many things, so many things, even about having the conference in Dallas, so many debates we had about whether we should come or not. Um, what, are our, what do you think our central role is as a comm scholar in this moment? Um, I just think about my role as a human in this moment. And so the work that I do in my community is just part of my being human, and it goes in and out of the university's boundaries. So I don't really, I mean, that's, that's part of the reason why I was really attracted to the, the idea of haunting as a very real, palpable sensibility that you have to do something. You can't just stay in this space. Um, and so I think we should all be thinking about what's our something and who are we really responding to. You know, one of the exciting things about this particular time of the conference is that we get a chance to get intellectually re-energized all over again. We've been energized throughout the day in various meetings and various kinds of uh, exchanges, but this is a very wonderful time to come together as scholars to think about issues that more broadly affect who we are. And I'm reminded of what Stuart Hall says when he says that identities are the names we give to the positions and the ways we are positioned by the narratives of the past. And here we are talking about ways in which our identities are imprinted on modes of exchange. And if you think about the, just the capitalist exchange that happens, where as she so vividly indicated, Dr. Squires talks about this, this rubbing of the thumbs through the money and touching the past and what that must feel like and I just feel like this is just such an amazing way to sort of think through how our identities are affected every day through everyday interactive exchanges. And even in passing, we don't even realize it. And then how that actually becomes now part of this imprint onto money, the very mode through which we're able to exchange products and services as well. So it's fascinating to me. I, I got so much out of that. I, I, I too agree that I can't wait till we see this in print so we can digest it even further and meditate on it. This is wonderful. Um, with no further ado, I want to offer to Dr. Squires um, a plaque indicating National Communication Association, Catherine R. Squires, University of Minnesota, Carol C. Arnold, Distinguished Lecture, November 2017. Thank you. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening. Hopefully we'll see you back here for Lyrical Justice in about an hour.